everyone has a story. Stories have power. Hello, Trisha. Great to see you. Nice to meet you, Doug. Let's go chat. Thank you. They help us understand each other. This is Jessup's Journal. Trisha, it's time to sign into Jessup's Journal. Thank you. Hi, I'm Doug Jessup. Welcome to this episode of Jessup's Journal. With me today, Trisha O'Hare. Trisha, thanks so much for coming on today. My pleasure. Now, uh, number one, for the people that are out there going, okay, who the heck is Trisha O'Hare? What's that? Sorry, you, you flew in today to, to visit with us special. So where are you calling home right now? Phoenix is home now. Phoenix, okay, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, just slightly different temperatures. Just a bit colder. So you are known as an author, you're known as an entrepreneur, you are known as a researcher, and you're also an inventor. So it's just like, wow, I gotta talk to this lady. And there's this little book over here called The Toothpaste Secret. So mm -hmm. there's a secret, okay, we're gonna find out. So what is the secret? Ooh, the secret is you don't need the toothpaste to get your teeth clean. Really, okay, mm -hmm. so the first question people are gonna ask is, how in the world does this lady know this stuff? So, Tell me about you know, how you determine that you don't need toothpaste. I've done the research and we've been able to show that if you brush without toothpaste, you're actually going to brush longer, more thoroughly around your mouth and more efficiently. Really? So if people put toothpaste on their toothbrush, it creates so many bubbles, they can't see what they're doing. They don't know where they're putting the brush. And the worst part is it numbs our tongue from the flavors and oh. they will run their tongue around their mouth and think everything is clean when it isn't. Okay, so how did you get into this research? Well, I always wanted to be a detective and I asked my father if, you know, I could be a policewoman because he was a police officer and eventually a chief of police. And he said to me, dear, you can be anything in the world you want to be, but you will not be a policewoman. So I mm. always wanted to be a detective. So in the dental world, I'm known as the oral health detective, trying to answer questions and solve mysteries. And I always look for the cause of the problem. And the problem I found with people who weren't brushing their teeth effectively was not them, it was the toothpaste. Really? So I blame the toothpaste and they feel much better that they're off the hook. Huh, okay, well that's kind of crazy. So mm -hmm. then you also have been helping in the dental world. Um, now, full disclosure, yeah, I'm gonna say hi to my daughter. Hi, hi, Celise. She is a dental assistant. And so there's a lot of education that goes into things. Mm -hmm. So there's a dental assistant and then there's a dental hygienist. What's mm -hmm. the difference? The couple of things. One is the amount of education that's needed between the two. And with the dental hygienist, they actually have to pass a licensing exam, whereas dental assistants don't have that and the education of a hygienist is about half that of a dentist. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now uh, I have to admit this is one of those things where, you know, it might get a little political, but I, I was doing some research on some of this stuff and you've got an actual university that you, you, you created that helps with this training. What's it called again? It's called O'Hare University and it's actually for hygienists who are already licensed and working to complete their bachelor's degree because they've only received an associate's degree. Okay, that's the thing that bugged me. Okay, mm -hmm. so the number of hours that you have to put in to get this training and everything, I mean, it's, it's a lot of hours. Um, mm -hmm. And why is it that they only get an associate's degree when it's actually should probably be you know, at least a bachelor's? Sometimes it makes you wonder with all the education if they ought to get a master's. But what's, what's the issue there? Well, I think it's educational malpractice caused by the American Dental Association. Really? All other professions control their own education, but because dental hygiene started over 100 years ago in dental schools as a program that the Dental Association, which accredits dental schools and creates the curriculum, also did that with dental hygiene in the beginning. But now that we have our own professional associations, we should be taking over that um, accreditation. But what the dentists have done is they have allowed the Dental Hygiene Association to add as much to the curriculum as they want, 
provided that it's still a two-year entry to practice with an associate's degree. There are some bachelor degree programs, but there has to be the entry to practice at two years, which means the hygienists do two years of prerequisites and then they squash three years into two in the community college. So there, I've done the research which is also published and the associate degree dental hygienists actually complete seven credit hours short of a master's degree. Really? Seven? <clears throat> seven that's hours, it. that's it. Wow, okay, mm -hmm. that's kind of crazy. So we had a decision to either sue the American Dental Association or every community college for educational malpractice. Oh dear. Yeah. And we thought, no, let's try. It's not gonna work. Let's try and find a better solution. So we developed a, an online university to recognize all the credits that the associate degree hygienists have completed and then provide them with the courses they weren't getting on how to actually achieve behavior change with people. And my co-founder is a dental hygienist in the UK. Actually, Tim is a hygienist, and I'm a hygienist because of the well, pronunciation. Yeah, okay, there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, potato, yeah. potato, huh? Yes. So what does a dental hygienist do then? A dental hygienist is the primary preventive specialist in the practice, and they do a lot of the examination. They look for disease. They also help patients change their behaviors with not just with toothbrushing and cleaning between their teeth, but also diet and cutting out sugars and, and looking at those things. And they do a lot of intra and extraoral examinations looking for lumps and bumps and uh, reds and white spots and oral cancer and things like that. Really? And they provide a lot of periodontal therapy. And in most states now, they give local anesthesia. Where I come from, we also did um, surgical curatage and suturing. So. It goes, and, then, and some hygienists are more orthodontic related, some are more perio related, some are focused on children, some on adults. Now, I remember when I was a kid, you know, back when dinosaurs roamed the land, but there were these pink little tablets that they had a shoe on, and mm -hmm. your, your face would go, well, actually your teeth, you know, it turned all pink. It's like, oh my goodness. And I, from what I remember, you were supposed to try to brush the heck out of this so you could get rid of this. What in the world, you know, were those and are they still even existing now? Fun memory of those pink tablets. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, those are called disclosing tablets. They disclose where the plaque biofilm, the bacteria on your teeth is so that you can see better and actually brush that off. And as a kid, you could see that. But adults, when they look, the gums are pink, the plaque is pink, they can't really distinguish. But now we have um, the same kind of a disclosing solution that has three colors. Oh, really? One for old plaque, one for new plaque, and one for plaque that's actually producing acid at the moment because they put a little sugar in the disclosing solution that feeds those bacteria immediately, and they immediately produce acid. Okay, now I, I'm not a chemist and I don't play one on TV, but it would seem that acid on your teeth is probably not a good thing. Not at all. Okay, so what does acid do to your teeth? Well, the enamel on our teeth is the hardest substance in the body. And the bacteria in the mouth actually feed off the sugars and uh, fermentable carbohydrates, the processed foods, flour and sugar, and they produce as a byproduct um, to taking that food as energy um, to produce acid. And this acid, repeatedly against the enamel of the tooth, will melt it and actually break right through. So. Ooh, that's not good. And can you imagine the hardest substance in the body and in just a few months we can destroy it with the amount of sugar and um, We don't flour. have diamonds in our mouth, so, no. you know, so yep. I guess you know, enamel is gonna get the next thing. <laughs> Sugar is one thing, but there's this other product that I'm familiar with that uh, apparently you've done some research as well that is called xylitol. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of sugar, I guess. Does mm -hmm. that create the acid as well? No, it doesn't. So what's the difference? Well, actually, xylitol is a sugar alcohol because of the structure, not because it's any alcohol. Okay. Um, but there are a couple ways that it works. When um, the bacteria encounter the xylitol, um, the xylitol tries to get through the membrane, outer membrane of the bacteria, and it gets through the outer membrane but can't get through the inner membrane. And so the bacteria turns on its energy pump and pumps it out, and then it comes back in, and the bacteria uses up all its energy without getting anything from the xylitol. And 
Um, also, the xylitol can block docking stations on the bacteria. And the bacteria, when they are going to form this sticky stuff on the teeth, actually send um, chemicals out to talk to each other because I thought in the beginning one bacteria stuck and then some more came, but it's not true. Um, if you even feel in the bottom teeth toward the back, right between the last two teeth, there's kind of a space where saliva is collecting. Right now there's millions of bacteria floating there as well. And they'll send out a boomerang chemical that only goes a fraction of a millimeter back and forth. But if it finds another bacteria, it will log on to the docking station and not come back. So that's how the bacteria calculate who's a, who else is around. And when they reach a quorum, which is the exact number they need to start sticking to the teeth, they all at the same point squirt out a polysaccharide slime that attaches them to the tooth. Slime. So that, yes. Oh boy, okay. That's a very scientific Yeah, very word. scientific term, okay. But when you put xylitol in the mouth, even if there's been sugar, the xylitol is going to block all these um, important docking stations and take up and go into the bacteria faster than regular sugar because of their small size. And that's going to actually reduce the bacteria that actually form on the teeth. So where, where in the world do you find products? I mean, what has xylitol in it? Then? Well, today we have xylitol in chewing gum, mouthwash, mints, candies, toothpaste. But in the original research, they actually replaced um, sugar in all the foods for three different groups. They did this in Finland. And they had a group of sucrose, fructose, and xylitol. But it was a real difficult study to do because if the people wanted ketchup or ice cream, they had to make it now with xylitol. And it became very expensive and difficult. So after that study showed an 85% reduction in tooth decay, they said, well, let's try something else. So they put it in chewing gum and had people, instead of replacing all sugar, just chew the gum after meals and snacks. And after that research, they got the same 85% reduction in tooth decay. Wow. So that's why you see it most often in chewing gum, candies, things like that. Okay. But you have to find a chewing gum that's really 100% xylitol sweetened, or at least has xylitol as the very first ingredient. Why is that? Because in many chewing gums on the market, you know, the typical ones that you'll see, they have, they'll say they have xylitol in, but they, it's so far down on the list of ingredients, you'd have to have, you know, 100 pieces of gum to rival that, That's big one, one gum yeah, wad. One big yeah. one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well. So it should be 100% to get the benefits that we are seeing in the research. Now, Tricia, we talked a bit about your one book that's been around for a long time, which is, of course, this one over here, The Toothpaste Secret. Mm -hmm. But I understand you also wrote another book. Mm -hmm. What's that one called? That one's called Lip Zip. Ah. Breathe Better to Live Better. Mm -hmm. What do you mean, breathe better to live better? It's um, a, a hidden secret, I think. They don't even teach it in medical schools, that when you breathe through your nose, and humans are meant to breathe in through the nose, out through the nose, and they start out as babies breathing through their nose. But when you breathe through your nose, nitric oxide is released in the sinuses that goes into your lungs with that air, and that will allow 18% more oxygen to be absorbed, reaching the brain and muscles compared to mouth breathing. Also, your nose filters everything, whereas if you breathe through your mouth, things are going directly into your lungs. Mm. And so our book is about cases that we've treated. We are both Buteco breathing coaches and um, have studied this as part. It fits in with dental hygiene perfectly. My co-author is Tim Ives, who's in the UK, also a founder of O'Hare University. But there are, we have little kids, teenagers, we have elderly, all different ages that we've treated and what their signs and symptoms were and how we got them to switch from mouth breathing back to nasal breathing and what the differences in their lives were and it makes a huge difference. Well, okay, so to me it would seem though, if you're sleeping, it's not mm -hmm. like you consciously can have your mouth open or closed. I mean, it just is what it is. How in the world would you even change that behavior? Um, it's actually very easy to change and it's a two-part change. First, you squirt your nose with a clear nasal spray. Make sure you can breathe through your nose. You don't want to tape your mouth if you can't breathe through your nose. So make sure you spray with the clear, and then you can use surgical paper tape, which then comes off very easily. And you just put a piece across your lips, fold one end in so you have something to grab in the morning to take it off, uh, but make sure you can 
are comfortable with the tape on and breathing through your nose, but what happens when your nose is, when your mouth is taped, your brain will keep your nose open. It's amazing. Really? Mm -hmm. huh. Because once people start um, breathing through their mouth, the brain plugs up their nose and they think they are breathing through their mouth because their nose is plugged, but it's the other way around in many cases. When they breathe through their mouth and inhale and exhale, they exhale CO2 too quickly. Through the nose, it slows it down so it's a slow exhale and it keeps more CO2 in the body, which is important for other things. But when you exhale CO2 too quickly, the brain goes, mm -hmm. <clears throat> there, that nose isn't working well. We're going to have to plug it up so it doesn't exhale CO2 too quickly because there are two respiratory centers in the brain. One knows if your nose or mouth breathing. The other is measuring CO2 exhale and inhale. Isn't the body an incredible thing? It is. Wow. And so as soon as you unplug the nose and, and close the mouth and breathe through your nose, your brain will keep your nose unplugged. And you just hope you don't get a cold. Right. Well, if, you, if you do get a cold, it's good to use the clear nasal spray. And if you don't have the spray with you, you can actually unplug your nose by holding your breath, breathe in through the nose, out through the nose, pinch your nose, bob your head up and down, hold your breath as long as you can. And that will give a signal to the brain that you're not exhaling CO2 too quickly. And the brain in that short amount of time will go, oh, we don't need to plug up the nose anymore and it will unplug the nose in that short time. Really? Have you ever had it happen where one nostril's plugged? Oh yeah. And the other isn't and then you don't even know what happens and it switches? The brain can do it that fast with unplugging the nose as well. Wow. That's pretty cool. I hadn't heard of that. So, so are you going to try taping? I, I, guess as, I guess we it, may have to, huh? It's an experiment. If you don't know if you breathe through your nose or your mouth, it's kind of fun to just tape once and see if you feel better in the morning. Because what happens is, is when you're breathing through your nose, getting more oxygen to your brain, you actually sleep in a more regenerative level. And so you will wake up more refreshed. So you've, you've done this taping and your brain kind of figures this out. Is it something that you have to keep doing for a while or, you know, I mean, what's, at what point in time do you not need the tape? Good question. Um, I became a mouth breather after a bad case of bronchitis where my nose was plugged and um, when I was over the bronchitis, I never switched back to nose breathing. I was just in the habit then of mouth breathing, especially at night. My mouth would get so dry, I always had a glass of water by my bed. So when I did the, the work to switch and I taped my mouth every night, it took me about three months to get really comfortable keeping my mouth closed. Some people don't want to risk it and will keep tape for the rest of their life, but um, it's, it's just individual. And some people even are able to tell themselves to keep their mouth closed when they go to bed at night and they can do that. So it's all different levels. As a educator and as a dental hygienist and all that specialty stuff, what are the questions you get asked the most often? <laughs> How can I have whiter teeth? And the answer? Close your mouth, breathe through your nose. <laughs> <laughs> Cut out sugar. Uh -huh. <laughs> Actually, baking soda is a great tooth whitener. Just brushing your teeth with baking soda works great. See, with me, I've got enough, you know, caps and this, that, and the other that, you know, yeah, they... I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. It's just interesting that they don't ask more about health, but once um, a little bit of information is presented, then it just piques their interest, especially when parents find out about the mouth breathing and that kids shouldn't be snoring. And if you ask if they have signs and symptoms of ADHD, then they often say yes. So if we get the kids to close their mouth, breathe through their nose, they get the first night, good night's sleep, those signs of ADHD are the same as sleep deprivation. So if we can get the kids to breathe through their nose and close their mouth, in a day you can see a change in a child's behavior. What causes snoring? It's very interesting. The, way, the reason we snore is the soft palate. You know, what you can feel with your tongue where the teeth are is hard palate, right behind that is soft. And if you're breathing through your mouth, it vibrates. And you can even um, have people breathing through their nose and find that it will vibrate because their tongue isn't in the roof of their mouth. This is another little bit of um, trivia. The place your tongue should be, like right now, should be resting on the roof of your mouth. And if your mouth breathing and the tongue's up there, it works like an orthodontic appliance. But when it rests there, you won't be able to snore because that soft palate won't be vibrating. So what's the cure for snoring? The cure for snoring? First is tape your mouth closed and breathe through your nose. 
Wow. And part of sleep apnea is when you're breathing through your mouth, the tongue falls into the back of the throat more easily because it isn't up on the roof of the mouth. So a lot of people have been able to really ha have an impact on the level of sleep apnea simply by breathing through their nose and taping their mouth. So you've been doing this dental stuff for quite a while. If you had to pick one game changer in your career, what would it be? The biggest game changer I think has been xylitol because just adding xylitol to the diet in chewing gum will reduce the plaque level by 50%. And if you look at the tooth brushing research, people can't even remove 50% of the plaque on their teeth. It's more like 42%. So if we can get people to use the xylitol, reduce the amount of plaque by 50% right from the get-go, and reduce sugars as well, we're gonna really make an impact on eliminating dental disease. Life kind of comes with scars, and it, mm -hmm. it leaves marks. And Rustico, uh, the guys that make Jessup's Journal, it, it is Jessup's Journal, I gotta have a journal, right? Um, they have a hashtag that says, leave your mark. So Trisha O'Hare, how do you want to leave your mark? I want to leave my mark by ending dental disease. And there are simple things that can be done and people don't ever have to suffer from dental disease. It's very easy to prevent. I know that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well you learned, heard that here first. So. Thank you so much for coming on Jessup's Journal. There are a couple other people we want to thank. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, we've got to thank Rustico, the folks that make mm -hmm. my journals. We have the folks at Clear Nasal Spray. Now, you know, you think about washing your hands, but have you thought about washing your nose? Good stuff. Okay. The other thing, of course, Ogden's Own Distillery. They make the hand sanitizer, and yeah, they do make adult beverages, just saying. And then Taylor Cooperative makes my clothes, and of course, don't forget JW Custom Hats. Here's the thing I want everyone to remember. Everyone has a story. Stories have power. They help us understand each other. With another entry into Jessup's Journal and Trisha O'Hare, I'm Doug Jessup, ABC4 News.